live English lesson. My name is Luke. I will be your teacher for this live English lesson. We're going to be looking at uh, an English lesson, another English lesson from someone else. <laughs> I'm, I'm out of ideas, and so instead of me teaching you English, I'm going to show you other people's English lessons. <laughs> no, you'll see what I mean in a very short time if you hang out for today's live lesson. Also, we'll be doing the classic Q&A. So if you have questions, grammar, pronunciation, culture, idioms and phrases, whatever it may be, let me know. I'll do my best to answer your questions. If you haven't already, don't forget to hit the like button immediately. Very important. Just huh, hit the like button or the thumbs up button uh, that supports the channel and also tells YouTube or Facebook or wherever you're watching thing happening here. Watch this. Also, subscribe so you can see future videos, future live streams, and uh, check out my courses. Those are in the links in the description. Full courses recently reached 80,000 students taking my courses. That's a big number. I'm pretty proud of that. I'm happy about that. Hey, Alyssa's here. Well, that's good news. All right, I'm going to quickly up Date the cover photo and just do that very quickly and then we'll get started. You know what? I was going to grab something to drink and I forgot. I like to have something to sip on during my live streams so that my throat doesn't get dry. But now I have nothing. What a disaster. Oh well. I might grab something in a minute. Yousef, hello. Sharif, hello. My name is Luke. My name is Luke. I'm an English teacher from the United States. Alyssa, no, not digging gold. You'll see what I mean very soon when we talk about the main topic. Let's just say it's strange, very strange. But uh, that's all I'll say for now. It's, it's, it could be a treat and it could be a shock. I'm not sure. It's either going to be a treat or a shock. Not sure which one it's going to be. I've already said my name, Sharif. My name is Luke. I'll say it one more time. My name is Luke. I am an English teacher from the United States. And today we're going to be looking at another English lesson and learning about verbs. And I'll also be answering questions. We do a Q&A, question and answer, okay? Rocky Pearl, that is correct. Yes, yes, I am live. Uncle Ben Hamar is here. Yes, good. Francisco is here. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Let me pop the let me pop the link into the old WhatsApp group before we before we get started. Keep the questions coming, guys. How are you all doing today? Having a good good day? Got a good weekend planned, fun stuff coming up, plans, interesting things. What, what, what? Digging a hole until you reach China. No, still not that, Alyssa. Not that, not that. Hello, Antonio. Welcome to today's live stream live English class guys don't forget to hit the like button as you come in that would be much appreciated I'd appreciate that from Fortaleza, Fortaleza Fortaleza Brazil okay I gotta look that up I'm not familiar with this place F T okay Fortaleza oh it looks beautiful Wow right by the ocean beaches very nice very nice population 2.6 million oh it's huge I, I'm embarrassed for not knowing about this place I feel like an idiot I should know about a place that has a population of 2.6 2.687 million people according to the 2020 census
Rocky Pearl says, Luke, you you are your, your, Y-O-U-R. Outside videos are really fun. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. That's a very nice thing to say. Great. Thanks, Rocky. Aleda is here. Hey, Luke, what's up? I'll tell you what's up. Um, I don't know, actually. Just this, this live stream is the only thing that's up, literally. I have nothing else going on. This is it. This is the only thing that I have up. Normally, I have something to drink, something to sip on. I don't. I forgot about it, and that's that's up, but it's not up in a not in a positive way. Yeah. Anyway, I don't want to complain. Mary McCain, hello. How all the all the people are here? Jeet is here with a with a Jeet's photo. You see the cat in Jeet's photo to see that cat there see if I can make this picture bigger that is my cat I'm not sure why Jeet's photo is my cat I think it's okay I don't mind it it's okay but that is my cat his name is Circle he's extremely cute can I bring up some pictures of Circle yeah, let me let me show you let me show you guys some some pictures of Circle. <clears throat> He's a very cute cat. <clears throat> Let's see what I've got. I might. It might be that I only have pictures of Circle. I, I used to take pictures of myself and other things, you know. But now I pretty much take pictures of my cat, and that's about it. <laughs> I still take pictures of, you know, my wife and things that I'm doing, I suppose, as well. But not as not as many as my cat, I think. I guess that's a little weird. But he's just so cute. What can you do? He's a cutie. Hold on. I'm grabbing a couple grabbing a couple things here. Let's see what have I got. It's a video. It may not be good to watch a video. Um, oh yeah, that's a good one. Here's a good one here. That's very good. Okay, that's a good one. Take my word for it. These are going to be good. These are going to be good ones. All right. Here, here, incoming. Pictures of my cat. Okay. So you got circle in a box. And he's he's almost asleep, I think, there, in a sitting in a box. And then we got Circle <laughs> sitting in a very funny posture uh, for some reason, <laughs> sitting like a person. Uh, sometimes he likes to do that. He likes to sit like a, a little human, which I think is weird, but that's what he likes to do. And... This is a good one. It's a good one. Sitting on my wife's lap there. And one more, one more. I just one more, one more. I know. I know you guys don't care about this, but I got to show you. Sleeping cat. Circle sleeping. He's very he's got a very nice personality. He's very easy to get along with. He's very friendly, very cool, cool guy. Very cool kid, this guy, Circle. Cool dude. Rocky also has a cool, a cool and cute, oh, very cute cat. Oh, that's nice. Very good. Rosalinda is here. Awesome. Mr. T Two Girl is here. It's a he. It's a boy. Boy cat. Wash up on our shoes. Hmm? Not quite sure what you mean there. Thanks, Antonio. Thanks for indulging my. Uh, thanks for indulging me on that. Boris Johnson. Johnson has warned the effects of a third wave of coronavirus will wash up on. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. This is actually a great question. I think to talk about. So I'm going to answer Kanan's question here because I think it's a really good one.
Whoa. Okay, now now the questions are all messed up. Let's fix this. <laughs> uh, being punished for sharing sharing photos of my cat. That's what's happening. I'm being punished for it. All right. That's better. That's better. Kenan Demir says, what does it mean? Boris Johnson has warned the effects of a third wave of coronavirus will wash up on our shores. What does this mean? So a shore is, as you might know, the line between the land and the sea. But it's not just any, it's not just the ocean. It could be any large body of water. It's not any ocean. It's any any kind of big body of water. It could be a lake. It could be the English Channel, which is what separates England from the rest of Europe. What does that mean? How can how can the effects of a third wave of coronavirus wash up? <laughs> what is that? The viruses floating up on the shore? That doesn't that doesn't make any sense. Well. This is an expression, okay? It's just an expression. It means arrive here, come here for the first time, usually for the first time. We're talking about the effects specifically of the third wave. Why don't we just talk about this whole thing here? Boris Johnson, prime minister of the UK. All right, he's got crazy hair. He's got very messy hair, and uh, he's, uh, he's a funny guy. He actually got COVID and, and got really sick, but then he, he survived. So that's good. The effects of something, the results, not just the thing itself, not just the wave of coronavirus itself, but the effects of it. So what would that be? Well, new cases would be one. Uh, sh stores closing down, maybe lockdowns, all of the things that you know about that are related to COVID-19. Okay. What about, what about wash up on our shores? How can the effects of something wash up on shores? Let's get into that a little bit more. And why is it the third wave? Well, apparently there was a first wave and a second wave. I'm not really sure what the exact difference is between the first and the second and why this is being the third. I don't know how this is counted. But anyway, this is whatever it is washing up on our shores. Could you say this if it's a country that is landlocked? Could you say this if it's a country that has no sea around it? Probably not. So if you if you have a country that's not by if you have a country that's not by the ocean, uh, it would be difficult to say that something is washing up on your shores. You'd probably just say, "Arrive in the country. Arrive in our country." That's probably what you would say. But if it's the United States, which has two oceans on either side, if it's China, which has all of the a, a long coastline, if it's England, which has the British Channel and then the Pacific Ocean on the other side, all of these, because they're surrounded by water, we can say wash up on our shores. And that would be a very common expression simply to, to mean arrive here, but not because we asked it to come here. That's the kind of feeling you get from it. It's not the feeling of, oh, please come over here. We bring it over here. We want it over here. But instead, it arrives as though it had floated over across the, the English Channel or across the Pacific Ocean and arrived here. And now it is here. So it has washed up on our shores. So that's how it's used. You'll hear it used pretty often. It's often used for unwanted things, things that we don't necessarily want. Nobody wants the effects of a third wave of coronavirus, but that is how it is typically used. Okay, good question. If you guys haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe, of course, and check out my full courses in the links in the description. Okay. All right. Let me just send a quick message here. I know I'm not supposed to check messages during a live stream, but I got to do it sometimes. I got to do it sometimes. 
Dream of and dream about. Um, people will use those interchangeably, but generally speaking, we generally this is how I would use it. Okay, this is how I would typically use it. <clears throat> to dream of would be a uh, the main topic or the main person, right? I I dreamed of a beautiful landscape. I dreamed about and then say what happened. You'd give the details. That's usually how it would be. Now, people will use those differently, of course, but that's generally how people use dream of and, and dream about. That's at least how I use dream of and dream about. Sorry if you guys can hear the voice. Uh, someone's on the phone in the other room. I know it's a little... A little loud. Sorry about that. Is, is, uh, daughter says could be metaphorical. You mean wash up on our shores? Oh, yes. It's absolutely metaphorical. It doesn't have anything to do actually with shores, usually. Um, please air me. I'm not sure what you mean by air me. Not sure what you mean by air me. Air me. Don't know what that means. Don't say China. They have spread to the whole world and now watching it with popcorn. Um, that's not fair. That's not fair. You can't blame a country, I think, for something that comes from that country. Right? If some person in Texas makes... A virus and it spreads around the world then what, what will you say the america virus what are you going to blame a country for something that happened in one guy's laboratory in texas insane if you blame a country and you blame all the people that's what leads to this sort of asian hate stuff that's happening and it's terrible and it's stupid and it's ridiculous it's uh, it's hateful i think i don't like it i don't agree with it um, i don't think it makes sense to to blame whole countries or populations or groups of people for things like that. How would you feel if something that happened in your country then became who you are and people are asking you, what do you think? This is your fault. What? That's insane. That's absolutely ridiculous, right? And you might say, okay, you're biased because you lived for five years in China and your wife is Chinese. Maybe so. Maybe I am biased. But... I would ask you, if that happened to your country, how would you feel? And everyone was saying, the whatever your country is virus, you probably wouldn't feel very good. And I don't think anyone would. So I think the best thing to do is just talk about solutions rather than casting blame. Not very useful. My opinion. Uh, air just means get on a live call. Oh, okay. I'm learning new things all the time. Wonderful. Um, not at the moment. I'm going to answer some questions. I'd like to know what is the mean of pronoun do in a sentence. Look, I was watching a movie. Then a girl said, you were right. I do have feelings for you. But why isn't it I have feelings? Oh, we've talked about this. I answered another question. We would use the word do to emphasize it, to make it stronger, to make it a little bit stronger. One sec. Let me check one thing. Okay. Thanks for your sincere reply. Of course. From India. Rocky's from India. Nice. All right. I 
did I miss? What else did I miss? Mm, I'm just scrolling up through questions. If you guys have other questions about anything, let me know. Let me know. Otherwise, I want to get to my topic for today. We can talk about that. Trugal says, by the way, uh, about how to order coffee video is amazing. So natural. Thanks. Watched a few times. Well, thank you very much. I'm actually a little surprised by the good reaction from that video because um, I, I'm not I, I've watched that video a couple times I'm not a big fan of that video I like some of my videos but that one I don't know I mean I think the content is okay but I don't I just not I'm not a big fan of how how I did it I guess the way I presented it but uh, I'm glad people like it I'm glad you like it it's been great to see the response from people, the reaction from people. Um, uh, but sometimes, you know, when you make a video, you might feel good about it, you might feel not so good about it, uh, uh, for whatever reason. And sometimes it's just the delivery or how you feel about yourself at that time. You know, there are a lot of different factors. So it's weird. The videos that people tend to like most are the ones that I like least. <laughs> and the ones that I like most people tend to like least but that's i guess that's just how it goes i don't know hello nihat hello hello mm, i'm not sure if you have an option to get on a call uh from the comment section um I, I, we've done calls in the past people have got on calls with me in the past once in a while I'm not planning to do it for this live stream, though, because I want to answer questions and I want to uh, have a topic to share. So I'm not planning to do it for this one. Um, what's the difference between... Ah, classic question from Fatima Books. Back with the comparisons. Love it. Love it. What's the difference between listen versus hear, talk versus speak? Fitch versus bring, happy versus glad. Way versus street versus path versus road versus route. <laughs> this is a challenging one. All right. Well, let's just try it and see what happens. Fatima Books says, what is the difference between listen versus hear, talk versus speaker? And I assume here Fatima means talk versus speak. Okay. So we'll talk about that. Because actually, talk versus speaker, those are different, totally different things. Fitch versus bring. And again, I think Fatima means here fetch, F-E-T-C-H, not F-I-T-C-H. Fetch versus bring. Happy versus glad. Way versus street versus path versus road versus route. Okay. So let's try to take these on. And some of them, I'll just say that's the same, I think. So let's see. Listen versus hear. Now, to listen is usually an action that we do, and it suggests a couple different things, but the main thing is that we're paying attention when someone is speaking. I'm listening. I'm listening. Now, we could say listen to music, but it's usually the connection between what we're doing with our ears and our mind being directed toward that, that source, whether it's music or a speaker or the other person in the conversation. So you could say to someone, I know that you hear me, but are you listening to me? That means maybe your ears are doing the thing that they do to transfer signals to the brain. They're doing that, but I'm not focusing my mind on that. So I'm not listening. And when we get distracted and we start daydreaming and someone is speaking and they say, right? And you said, wait, 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 what, what, what happened? Huh? Sorry, I, I wasn't listening. I got distracted. I was dreaming about something. I was daydreaming about something. I wasn't listening. Now, we do also sometimes say that with hear. But often when we say, I feel like you don't hear me, this is not a, an inability to pay attention. So when we say, you can't hear me, 
in that sort of higher meaning, what we mean is you don't understand me in a deeper, a deeper way, on a deeper level. I feel you're not hearing me, as though I have deep concerns, I have problems that you're not understanding. And it's not that you didn't understand my words. You were paying attention, you were listening, but for whatever reason, you're not able to fully empathize with me and maybe do something that would make me feel better. I feel like you're not really hearing me. Or I think you really are hearing me for the first time. And we would say that to mean deeply understand as opposed to just understand the words. You'd understand the words if you're listening. Then you would say I was listening. If you're not listening, that means you're not paying attention and you don't understand anything because you were daydreaming. But we also use here for the very basic meaning, which is just what your ear is doing. So we say we have a sense of hearing. We don't say we have a sense of listening. That's not this sense. This sense is called hearing. Taste, touch, sight, smell. Hearing. Hearing, not listening. Listening is mind plus ear, attention plus ear, and hearing is just the sense itself. You have ears to hear, but hearing is also used in other ways, not just for that sense. With those who have the ears to hear, those who are able to understand or empathize. So it's used in that way too. Okay. What about talk versus speak? Well, this is similar in a lot of ways. Talking is just the mouth moving, making sounds that make sense, right? It's it's not talking maybe if you just say blah, 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 blah. But it would be talking if the sounds that you're making make sense and follow a grammatical structure and are part of a language. Then you could say, I'm talking. Now, you could also say, I'm speaking. I'm speaking, I'm talking. So in that way, they're the same. But when we use speak, we often use it in much broader ways. So we talk about free speech. This is not just the ability to say words, but to communicate what you want to communicate. My speech is being impeded or blocked. That means that I'm not able to communicate. Then speech or talking is just the mode. And when we talk about free speech, we're not only talking about using our mouths. We're also talking about writing. We're also talking about sign language, right? So we would say talking, talking is what we do with our mouths and speech is also what we do with our mouths, but much more is more about the communication aspect. And the person who stands there on the stage and says things, yes, they are talking, but they're also speaking. And speaking includes their meaning. Speaking includes what they're trying to say. Speaking includes how they're trying to communicate, right? Their ideas. We might talk about the speech that they gave. And yes, you do hear people say like TED Talks. That was a great talk. But when we actually go into the details, we say, so you were speaking about this. You were speaking about this to focus a little bit more on the meanings. And that person is not the talker, but the speaker. Okay. Now, what about fetch versus bring? So bring is much more general. Bring is very common. Bring something means to take it from one place to another, often from there to here. Please bring that to me. I will bring things home. I brought something home from the office, right? To bring up new ideas, to bring something across, to bring something over a bridge, to, to, uh, bring, uh, to, to, to bring something to the table. There's so many different expressions that use bring and not as many that use fetch. So fetch is much less common. Fetch is not a particularly common word. The first thing that comes up in my mind when I hear the word fetch is to throw a stick or a ball and a dog goes to get it and then brings it back. They bring it back, but what they're doing is fetch. Now you could say, could you fetch me the paper or could you fetch this or that for me? Yes, but typically in daily conversation, while fetch and bring tend to have the same meaning, bring will be far more common than fetch. Now, what about happy versus glad? Happy versus glad have the same meaning, right? But we would use them in different ways. So the meaning is the same, but the usage is slightly different. Happy, that's my mood. My mood is happy. I'm happy. I'm happy about that. That's great. I feel good. What's your mood? Happy. But would you say hap glad is a mood? No, you wouldn't say I'm glad. By itself, what's your mood? Glad. 
Glad is not one of the moods that we have. We don't use glad as a mood, but we do use glad to talk about a happy mood. We would say, I'm glad to hear that. Or, or really, that makes me feel so glad, right? So glad is not as common as happy. It means the same thing, but glad to hear that is like happy to hear that. And we would use the word glad to talk about being happy, although we wouldn't call the emotion happiness glad or even gladness. Now, gladness is a word, but we don't use it to, we don't usually use it to describe the way that we feel at the moment. Okay? So that's happy versus glad. Way, street, path, road, route. I'll go through these very quickly. Way is very general. It doesn't have to have anything to do with any surface or anything like that. Which way? That way. Let me show you the way. That means maybe I'll give you direction in life. Any kind of pointing is way. It's very broad, right? Even, even as broad as saying the way, also known as the Tao. And that's extremely broad. That's a, that's a, a, a Chinese idea, the Tao, the way, because it's so general. Street then is strictly the thing that we walk on, the thing that we walk down. And we might have buildings beside the street, or we might say, I live on Pine Street, but we wouldn't usually use street in the same broad sense that we would use way. Typically, street is the physical thing in the town or the physical thing that you walk along or where you live. And then path is usually informal, maybe strictly for walkers or people on their bicycles, no cars allowed. So you might have a walking path, but often this is something that is not paved. Often this is something that has been worn down by people's feet. So it's a, it's a human made little road that people follow. And if people stop going down that path, then it may grow back and you would never know that it was a path. But you hear the word path used to describe things like learning, things like education, things like careers, your career path. We say things like that because these are more organic. It's not like a street. It would be weird to say my career street, right? My education street. Sounds strange. Path, because these, these are human things. These are more natural things, things that we follow along, right? Things that we participate in, things that we have to be engaged in, in the same way that we would walk down a forest path. And this has been worn down by others before us and others who may come after us. And then road is pretty broad. Road and street are very similar, but a street has a sort of built sense, whereas a road might describe the countryside. Where I came from uh, in the countryside, we would say road instead of street. Street we would use inside the town or the city, and road we would use outside, going outside of, of the city. Smaller roads without a lot of buildings uh, beside them, or, or smaller. Well, yes, a road is more general than a street, and a street generally gives us this sense of being in a town or a city, typically, typically. And a road is a, a somewhat broader thing, but it is usually still about that physical thing that the cars are on. Finally, route or route. This is the path that you follow. This is the directions that you follow. So you might have the same route every day to work. You walk the same way on the way to work. That is your route. A bus driver has a route. They follow the same path Every single day, they go down the same streets because those are where the bus stops are. That's where the bus stops are. So that's the route. So that's my best attempt to answer all of these, uh, to talk about all of these as sort of I use them. And you could find much more complete explanations and definitions on a website like the Free Dictionary or somewhere else. But uh, hopefully that gives you a pretty good picture, at least, of how these are used. If you guys haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button, of course. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and also check out my full courses in the links in the description. It's been a while, Fatima. A while since we've had one of your classic questions. Always a challenge to talk about those. Always a challenge. They usually, they typically give me a headache but I like, I, li I like that you ask them. It usually hurts my brain. 
Fetch reminds me of Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. There you go. Yeah. It's got an older English feel to it sometimes, for sure. Hey, Luba. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. M2 Grohl, uh, what, are, what is your question or what are you confused about? Let me know. Buying a new house, inviting people in, make them feel lunch or dinner, or just celebrate. Such a term. Inviting people in, make them feel Make them lunch or dinner to celebrate. Um, Mary, I'm not sure I totally get it. Maybe you can um, clarify that a little bit for me. I appreciate that. Inviting people over, we have phrases for that, but I'm not quite sure I understand the lunch or dinner to celebrate part. Don't quite get that part. Can we use valuable, invaluable, and priceless when describing non-physical objects like assets, life, lessons, experiences? Uh, ooh, ah, this is a great question from Alyssa. Thanks, Antonio. Much appreciated. Great question from Alyssa. Alyssa says, can we use valuable? invaluable and priceless when describing non-physical objects like assets, life lessons, experiences, lectures, etc. And the answer is yes. Although I wouldn't call them objects. I would call them things, but I wouldn't call them objects because objects typically are physical things. Now, you can talk about objects in, you know, programming and stuff, but usually when we talk about an object in the way that we're talking about it here, it's going to be a thing. Now, of course, there's the object of the sentence, there's the grammatical usage, there are other ways to do it, or rather to talk about it as well. But let's not call these objects, okay? So let's say life lessons, experiences, those are great. Lectures, awesome. Let's just say experiences, because all of those are experiences anyway, right? So can we use this thing is valuable. This thing is invaluable, priceless. Let's say you got scammed. Someone scammed you and you lost $500, just gone. It was stolen from you. You thought you were signing up for something that was going to benefit you, but then you realized it was a scam and poof, your money is gone. Now you might say, ah, Damn it, I lost my money. But I've learned something. I've learned how to better identify this kind of thing. So because I've experienced this pain, I had a good lesson. I've learned something important that I can use going forward in my life. This was a valuable lesson. Now, I think then the question is, how valuable was it? So that's where you get to the question of valuable, invaluable, and priceless. Valuable is less than invaluable. Valuable just means it's very good. That was a valuable lesson. And that's a very common phrase. Valuable lesson. A valuable lesson. Parents say to their kids, Little Timmy, I hope you learned a valuable lesson today. I hope this experience of losing in this game has taught you a valuable lesson about the power of practice or teamwork or whatever. That's a ridiculous example. But maybe, yeah, maybe little Timmy is crying because he didn't he didn't win his his soccer match. And he's crying about it and his his father wants to give him a lesson because he feels that little Timmy could have practiced more. I don't know what kind of father this is or why his name is Little Timmy. Just f please follow along. So Little Timmy is crying uh, and uh, his father says, well, losing is part of life. You have to accept defeat and learn from it. And also, I think uh, you and your team, <laughs> that's getting really bad, need to work on your teamwork, your ability to share the ball 
pass the ball when, when you need to pass it, right? You need to learn about teamwork. This could be a valuable lesson for you and your teammates. A valuable lesson. Okay. What about an invaluable lesson? Well, it depends on you. It's subjective. What is extremely valuable? Maybe the scam story. Maybe that taught you a lesson that's so important to you that you are now a different person. Well, so instead of saying it's a valuable lesson, you might say that's an invaluable life experience that I had. Priceless. Priceless. Now, could you use it for things like lectures? Yeah. That, that your lecture is priceless. I've listened to it a hundred times. Absolutely priceless to me. Priceless means I can't put a value on it because I value it so much. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what about friendship? Yeah, sure, you could call a friendship invaluable. Your invaluable friendship, your priceless friendship. Invaluable, probably more common for that one. What about you? You're priceless. Eh, maybe. Maybe you could use that. You're invaluable. Yes, if someone is very useful to you, your help during this difficult time has been invaluable. Your help during this difficult time has been absolutely priceless. Yes, you could use either of those. Now, could we say your help during this difficult time has been valuable, just valuable? Absolutely, but that's not as strong, not as much punch compared to invaluable or priceless. So that's where it gets into the subjective feeling of how valuable do you think it is? Well, that's subjective. That's kind of up to you. You decide how valuable something is, whether you're talking about someone's help, contributions, experiences, lessons, whatever, books that you've read. Right? This book is invaluable. That doesn't mean that the physical book itself is invaluable. I'll sell it to you for $5. I'll throw it in the trash can. That's not the thing that's invaluable. Even though I say, this book that I'm holding in my hand, this book is invaluable. I could, I could make that statement and then immediately throw it in the trash can and still mean it's invaluable. How can that be? Because it's not that specific physical book that's valuable to me, that's invaluable to me, that's priceless to me. It's the knowledge that I got from it. So I don't care about the specific pages of this book, throw it away, I could buy another one. But the important thing is that I have it in here. I read it and I got something from it. And that's the thing I value. So that's how we talk about non-physical things using these, uh, th these three words. Very good question from Melissa. I really appreciate it. Guys, if you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button. Also, subscribe so that you can see future videos and uh, live streams. And also check out my full courses in the links in the description. Those are on sale. Hey, YouTube is here. Learning English lessons. I know YouTube. YouTube is always here. Come on, YouTube. Don't you have better stuff to do? Um, Rocky says, your lesson about the cemetery was awesome, Luke. Thanks a million. Oh, thank you very much. You're live about the cemetery. Having coffee. Those are my two favorites. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad you like those. I walk in the cemetery almost every day. <laughs> is that, was that weird? I love walking in the cemetery. Inviting people over, celebrating new purchase of a house. Uh, people would bring some presents and then give them a host. Ah. Yes. Yes. Yes, indeed. So let me answer Alyssa's question. Yeah, Alyssa, great question. Mary McCain says, inviting people over to celebrate, to celebrate uh, the new purchased house, newly purchased, a uh, newly purchased house. People would bring some presents with them to give the host. 
That's what I mean. This is in reference to an earlier question from Mary about having people over to your home. And they are guests, and you're the host, but it's a new house. That's the key detail. This is pretty simple. So I'll talk about the cultural side and the meaning and the word we use. We say housewarming party. Housewarming party. And the gifts that someone might bring would be housewarming gifts. Sometimes people will just say a housewarming. I'm going to a housewarming tomorrow, tomorrow evening. Or we use it as an adjective. I'm going to a housewarming party or event. You could say event instead of party tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, probably, probably tomorrow evening. I mean, usually it's either in the evening or it's maybe in the afternoon on weekends. It might be on weekends. So that's what it's called. What do people do? It's not a very formal thing, right? It's not like a, uh, a party you dress up to and it's very formal like a wedding. And, oh, welcome to my house. It's usually very relaxed with friends. There might be drinks. People are having some food. But it's not usually a sit-down meal. Now, it might be. Of course, there are a lot of variations. This is not a strict thing that has to happen in a certain way. But that's kind of the point is that it's relaxed. If you want to have a meal, you want to sit down, everybody at the table, sit down and have a big meal, okay, fine. But if you want to have everyone over and there's some beer and maybe somebody's cooking chicken wings and there are some chips and salsa snacks, okay, that's fine too. It doesn't have to be any certain way, right? Some people might want to have, if it's a very nice fancy house and they're very fancy people, they might want to have a fancy housewarming party. So. It's all good. It's not like it's not like Thanksgiving where there's a general specific style. Thanksgiving is the same for a lot of people in America. People celebrate in a very similar way with specific types of food. You know, people don't give gifts. They just enjoy food and and each other's company and watch football and the Thanksgiving Day parade and get fat. That's Thanksgiving. Most people do it that way. And there's turkey and mashed potatoes. But a housewarming party, it's not strict like that. It's, a, it's an event and you can do it how you want to do it. So if you want to invite five people over and just have a little gathering with some drinks so that people can see your new house, cool, do that. If you want to invite 30 people because you have a lot of friends and you want to make it a dinner and everyone sits down and you have catering and everyone has to wear a tuxedo, I think that would be a little weird personally, but Hey, I'm sure people have done it. Again, the point there is it's not strict. You don't have to do it a certain way, but people absolutely do that. And as the host, you're responsible for the experience. And you're probably responsible for providing the food, providing the snacks if you're just doing snacks. And maybe if you live far away, maybe, 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 maybe providing transportation for some people. But it really depends on the situation. So that's a good question from Mary McCain. Guys, if you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe so that you can see future videos and check out my full courses in the links in the description. Okay. Thank you, Mary. I don't stay up late at night because you try to catch your live stream. Well, Rocky, Rocky's a big fan. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. That means a lot. Awesome. Hello, Luba. I think Iranians, Turkish, and Russians <clears throat> and Indians celebrate. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe everybody in the world does. I mean, it's possible. Who knows? From where do you do this video? I live in a little town on the East Coast called New York City. Not sure if you've ever heard of it. It's got a lot of grumpy people. It's cold during the winter. A lot of snow. Uh, it's expensive. Um... Nice parks, 
Mm, good museums. Great pizza. Ooh, the pizza. The pizza's outstanding. Uh, very disgusting subway with rats. Rats this big in the subway. Huge. And the rats also eat pizza. The rats like pizza too. New York City rats love New York City pizza. Um, and when some people pass, do you really make a gathering at the window of the house like in movies? <laughs> Um, Elena, you might be surprised. In New York City, for example, where I live, never, not in a million years, not in a million years. It's too big. It's a big city, and people don't say hi to each other on the subway. You're not supposed to talk to others. You just kind of keep to yourself. You walk past other people. I don't know who my neighbors are. I've never met them before. I don't know anything about them. They live five feet away from me. They're on the other side of that wall. They're right there. If <laughs> I don't know who they are. So it depends on where you are. It's not like America is one way, one specific way. But if you go to places in the South or Texas, you drive by and people just wave at you. Walking down the street, cars driving by, People will just wave at you. The drivers of the car will just wave at you. I remember when I was a kid, the farm tractors would go by and the, everyone on the everyone would always wave like that. They wave like that. Do a quick wave as they drive by. Now, do people stop by the window and have a chat? In a very small town, people live nearby. They know each other. It doesn't have to be a window specifically. It could be out in the lawn. It could be in the driveway. It could be... Uh, on the porch. Yeah, yeah, sure. Small towns, especially the farther south you go. I think people tend to be a little, live a slightly slower lifestyle, be a little bit more relaxed. And yeah, as a result, I think, uh, I think you might see something like that on occasion, but uh, maybe not specifically at the window. Although, I've never done that. I don't look at people when I pass them by. I'm, I'm, I'm the grumpiest of all New Yorkers. Hey, get out of my way. Move. <laughs> That's me on the subway. No, I'm, no I'm usually, I'm, I usually try to be pretty friendly, but it's a big city, so you don't have energy to meet everybody. I'm a friendly. I'm friendly. I think I'm fair, reasonably friendly in person. But I am curious what impression you guys have of me as a person. Would you imagine that I'm very outgoing and open and laughy and talkative in, in public when I meet people? Or would you imagine that I'm quiet, reserved, that I don't talk very much? I'm curious what you think. What part of New York do you live in? Um, not Midtown. I live in Queens. I live in Queens, Queens, Queens. All right. Let me share my topic, if that's okay with you. Um, I'm going to pop on these headphones because we got to watch a video. This is going to be this is going to be interesting. I think this is going to be good. Amar says, "I think you're more of a quiet person." Absolutely. You're right. I can sit in silence for five days in a row and be as happy as a clam. Oh, you guys know me so well. How did, I don't know how you notice because I talk constantly in live streams, but you're right. Absolutely. I'm definitely an introvert. Definitely. So... About 10 years ago, I had a friend who showed me a video. This was before I was an English teacher, more than 10 years ago, perhaps. He showed me a video that had gone viral on YouTube, and it was a very strange video. It was an English language learning video. And in the video, the teacher, the guy 
teaching English to English language learners said something very odd. And it always stuck in my mind. That's a very weird video. Kind of creepy. Very strange. And it always was in my head. And I sometimes wonder if perhaps it is one of the reasons that unconsciously I decided to start teaching English. I don't know. Who knows? But I, I was never able to find the video. I looked and I looked and I looked for this video because I remembered the line from it very clearly. And I couldn't find it. But I wouldn't be talking about this if I didn't have some, some news on this. I found it. I found the video. So this is an English video, an English language learning lesson from the 1980s produced for local television in Austin, Texas. Okay. And it's for, it's for English learners. Now I thought going back to it, I would think again, how strange, how creepy. And maybe it is, maybe it is a little weird, but maybe not. The question is, we're going to watch it. The question is, can we learn from it? And is it possible that being weird or perhaps creepy is actually a good thing for learning because it makes it more memorable? That's the question to ask. So let's take a look at the video. We'll watch it twice. Once at the beginning, then we'll go over a couple of the phrases mentioned in it. And then we will talk about whether or not its weirdness is a good thing or a bad thing. Okay, so let's take a look at the at the video. Here we go. So now three, you have three words here. Dig, dug, dug. Dig, dug, dug. Why dig, dug, dug? Well, they're verbs. So pay attention to the verbs. Okay, here we go. What is this? I'm digging a hole. Did you dig all of it by yourself? Yes. It was hard, but I dug all of it. How long have you been digging? I've been digging for three days. But don't worry. I have experience. I've dug lots of holes before. But it's so big. An elephant could go into it. Why are you digging it? Shh. That's a secret. You'll see. <laughs> okay, that's it. That's it. <laughs> I don't know what you think. The thing that stuck out to me, the line I always remembered was the man, the voiceover says, what are you doing? And the guy digging a hole looks up in a very strange way, slowly, like, <laughs> like a serial killer and says, I'm digging a hole. It's very, it gave me the creeps when I watched it the first time. And it is kind of creepy. Uh, but hold on a second. This comes from a whole series of lessons. And I watched more of them. And I, I found that because I originally thought this was unintentional unintentionally kind of weird and creepy. I found that most of them have this kind of style and I think it's totally intentional. I think this guy might be a genius and he wants to make everything he does slightly odd, awkward, slightly creepy because he wants it to stick in your head. And that's the question. Is it better to learn things that are totally correct, totally natural, said in a natural way, a normal thing like I'm having a cappuccino. I'm having a cappuccino. Well, that's a normal, ordinary, everyday type of thing, right? But would you remember that? Would that stick in your head better than this guy with a mustache looking up at the camera saying, I'm digging a hole, as he clearly digs a hole for a dead person that he killed, maybe. I, mean, I don't know what it is for, right? But that sticks in your mind. So I find it interesting to then ask the question, what makes things useful? When you learn things, what's useful? Yes, it's good to learn the totally natural way to say things in a conversation. I'm having a cappuccino. But it might also be useful to make a strange example, an odd example, a slightly creepy example that's going to cause the image, the phrase, the thing you learn to stay in your head. Both of those things so that you have the ability to use the grammar, the whatever, the phrase, 
naturally in a conversation and the ability to remember it. And I think he's going for usage, but he's also going for memory. He wants to make it stick. And personally, I am now a fan. So I still think it's creepy, but I think it's creepy in a good way, and I think he intends it to be creepy. So let's just go over quickly the phrases that he talks about. I'm digging a hole. So he's using the present continuous tense, digging, to say what he's doing now. What are you doing? I'm digging a hole. It's an ongoing thing. I dug all of it. I dug all of it. So past tense, simple past tense. This is a thing that happened in the past. This is his response. He did it all by himself. He dug it. I've been digging for three days. So this is a continuous thing. It's an ongoing thing that's happening, right? Because it's continuous and it started in the past, then we would use the present perfect continuous tense. So perfect, I've been digging. Now, we could say something more, more ordinary, right? We could say, I've been living here at this hotel for three days, or I've been staying here at this hotel for three days. Yeah, of course, that might be more every day, but which one are you going to remember more? And then the last thing, I, I've dug lots of holes before. I have dug. So this is the past perfect tense. I've dug lots of holes before. Now, this is also pretty, pretty creepy if you ask me, but memorable, memorable. So I don't know what you think, but you can check out this guy's videos. They are from a series called, I believe, Everyday English uh, or is it English every day or Everyday English? I'll put it in the in the link in the description. Uh, the link to his videos so that you can check out more of them if you're interested. Uh, but the thing to take away in addition to these very useful examples with tenses is what makes something memorable. And there is some good scientific evidence that says weird things stick better in the memory than very ordinary things. So there's a good case for this lesson. Let's watch it one more time and uh, see if you can catch all of the different uses of the verb dig. Ready? What is this? I'm digging a hole. Did you dig all of it by yourself? Yes. It was hard, but I dug all of it. How long have you been digging? I've been digging for three days. But don't worry, I have experience. I've dug lots of holes before. But it's so big, an elephant could go into it. Why are you digging it? Shh. That's a secret. You'll see. Yeah. I think he's digging the hole for the narrator. That's that's what the hole is for. I think that, that that horror story does not end well for the narrator. So, uh, let me know what you think of this video or videos like this. And if you come up with other strange or interesting images to remember things, let me know what those are in the comments. If you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Also, feel free to check out my full courses in the link in the description. Uh, yes, very creepy. I've dug lots of holes. I have experience. Why will you dig lots of holes? How many people have you killed, sir? And what have you done with the narrator? Where's the narrator? Tell us tell us where the narrator is. Actually, he's the he's the narrator as well. <laughs> um I will put the link in there to, to that, but also, uh, also, I can tell you what it is. Is it every day or English every day? English at hmm? what is it? I forget. Mm. The guy's name is Greg Thompson. 
and it's ah English English at home oh is it English at home at home with English I was totally totally wrong at home with English sorry at home with English it's a whole series I believe it's six six series uh, I could be wrong but it was published in 1987 a long time ago wow cool I used to watch an English teaching show called Walter and Connie when I was little I think it's the reason why I prefer British to American English makes sense Could you tell me what does it mean in the platonic ideal world? Oh, um, that's a philosophical reference. So Platon, uh, Plato's forms. So uh, I'll just answer this. Not really. I don't know if it's an English question, but uh, Mahmud says, could you please tell me what does this mean in this platonic ideal world? So anytime you hear platonic, well, not anytime, but often when you hear platonic, especially when it's accompanied by ideal or forms, you'll hear sometimes the world of forms or ideals. It's about Plato's idea called the world of forms or sometimes called Plato's ideals. So Plato believed that there was a perfect world up there, in some ways not quite a heaven, but in some ways this sort of perfect place where you would have a, you would have the pure version of everything, the original, let's call it, the one that is the form of each thing. So, so the classic example is the rabbit, right? So what is a what is a platonic rabbit? Well, whatever it is that makes it a rabbit, its essence, the rabbit has this platonic form that only exists in this unseen realm called the platonic realm of ideals or the world of forms. It, its rabbitness is there, and it is the perfect rabbit. And every real rabbit in the world that you see is a kind of imperfect version of that. It's kind of up there, unseen, not, not very clearly defined. And everything in the world around us is just a, a crude, imperfect copy. Like if you were to take a, a CAD file, you know CAD, you design a 3D model. That would be the perfect thing the perfect object, and then you print it out with a 3D printer. But you print it out with, in chocolate, and I print it out in another material. We use different kinds of materials, and we have different qualities of printers. So every print of this object is going to be slightly different. Each one is going to be imperfect in a different way. None of them will, with absolute perfectness, match the ideal the platonic form of that thing, which in my computer example would be the model on the computer. So that's kind of how Plato's ideals worked. His world of forms wasn't real. And some people say that actually ideas about heaven and the afterlife were inspired by, by Plato because he believed in this non-physical in a way, non-physical place or realm where these things were eternal and always there and always true. That's what uh, that's what he he believed. That's what he believed. Um, and then and then his one of his students, Aristotle, came along and he had a different idea. And his was a little bit more more realistic. But anyway, that's not really an English question. When you see this, that's what it refers to. So uh, thanks for indulging the answer. If you haven't already, guys, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. Also, check out my full videos in the links, or rather full courses in the links in the description. Okay.
What's an existential crisis? People use it uh, in a very casual way, meaning that they're having a very deep crisis in their lives, uh, what their lives mean, and uh, sometimes, sometimes it's a, a thing that happens on one day because something goes wrong, but often it's used too casually. A real existential crisis would be nothing means anything, and you realize that you realize that your destiny is completely in your own hands. No one can tell you what is actually right or wrong. Nothing truly uh, makes sense or has value inherently. And uh, you realize that and then you feel a sense of panic as a result. <laughs> what is the meaning of creepy? Creepy, 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 creepy. Uh, creepy is like a little scary, but not in a way that's terrifying, but just a little scary and odd. Odd plus scary is creepy. Done versus through. Um, yeah, generally done versus through are used in the same way. Done versus through are pretty much the same, but done is more common than through. Are you through? Explaining something. Are you done? Explaining something. Done is more everyday. Done is more common. Through is a little bit more formal and, uh, and much less common. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for all the questions. I really appreciate it. Uh, if I didn't get to answer your question, I apologize. I'll get to it hopefully in the next one. So make sure you're subscribed so that you see when we go live next. One of these days, we're going to have scheduled live lessons. Not yet. Antonio says, do you have children? I do not have children. Not at the moment. Not yet. Uh, so thanks for joining. Thanks for the great questions. Much appreciated. And uh, I, I posted a video earlier today, which you're welcome to check out. So feel free to check that out on the channel. And otherwise, I hope you have a fantastic weekend. And I will see you, I hope, next week. Don't forget to hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe. Check out the courses. And, uh, yep, have a good one. Take care. Bye, everybody.